Good afternoon. afternoon. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> We've got an echo. <laughs> Uh, we're getting better at this every time. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar on seizures. I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy. Um, and for those of you that don't know me, I'm Michael Wong. I'm a veterinary neurologist here in Miami at Southeast Veterinary Neurology. Uh, we've got locations in Boynton Beach, Florida, and uh, opening Jupiter a little bit later this year. <clears throat> we'll be talking about seizures today. So seizures are the most common neurological condition in dogs and cats. It's also the topic that I receive the most phone calls about from primary care uh, veterinarians. So this afternoon, we will spend most of our time discussing the treatment of seizures, but we'll spend a small amount of time reviewing seizure pathophysiology, causes of seizures, and the diagnostic approach. But the majority of our time is going to focus on treatment principles and medications. I'm really aiming to make this useful to you and as practical and uh, valuable as possible. So what exactly is a seizure? Uh, a seizure is the clinical manifestation of excessive and or hypersynchronous electrical activity in the cerebral cortex. So uh, the seizure isn't a, um, a disease. A seizure is a symptom of a disease. So a seizure is what we see on the outside when there is this excessive and uh, hypersynchronous electrical activity happening on the inside of the brain. Seizures can often be described as focal or generalized. Um, a focal seizure occurs when the excessive and hypersynchronous electrical activity is limited to one region of the cerebral cortex. Clinically, we might see one part of the body or uh, one part of the face having these rhythmic contractions. Consciousness may or may not be altered. Alternatively, the abnormal electrical activity can affect the entire cerebral cortex, causing generalized seizures as we've all seen. In generalized clonic tonic seizures, patients lose consciousness, they might paddle, their jaws may chomp, they might salivate, they might urinate, they might defecate. It can last anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes. Most dogs act abnormal just before the seizure and most are disoriented after seizures. Some dogs may act blind, some dogs pace, they might seem really tired, uh, et cetera, after a seizure. But many times, seizures are, are very episodic, and by the time we see them in person, they're back to normal. So since they might be normal at the time of examination, a thorough history is very, very, very important. Oftentimes, a video of the episode is helpful, um, but this should be followed by a thorough physical and neurological examination. That should lead you to uh, be able to give an anatomic localization, and using that information, we should be able to come up with a list of possible causes, and using that list of possible causes, have a plan to systematically rule out things outside of the brain, things inside of the brain, and by getting to a diagnosis, we should be able to come to the best treatment plan and give that pet parent a accurate prognosis. The history of a patient with suspected seizures is very, very important, especially if the seizures are not witnessed firsthand. Signalment's important in that age of onset uh, strongly influences our differential diagnosis. Patients younger than one year of age are more likely to have problems such as uh, toxic causes, congenital causes, metabolic or infectious causes of seizures. Older patients are more likely to have structural causes such as tumors and strokes. And idiopathic epilepsy, the most common cause of seizures, typically comes on between one and five years of age. Said another way, it's unlikely that a dog younger than one or older than six is, um, it's unlikely that a dog younger than one or older than six um, is going to have idiopathic epilepsy. Breed is also important. For example, the list of concerns for a one-year-old Yorkie is very different than those for a three-year-old German Shepherd, and those are very different than the list of possible causes for a 10 or 12 year old German golden retriever. So um, a thorough description of the episode is important. We should be asking specific questions such as 
what's the pet doing immediately before the seizure? Are we resting? Are we sleeping? Are we excited? Are we active? Are we uh, posturing to urinate or defecate? How long does the episode last? Uh, how long does it take for that pet to go back to normal after the seizure? Uh, the client should also be questioned as to what the pet's like acting, uh, what the pet is acting like between episodes. And again, videos can be very, very useful. The, the first step in treating seizures is actually making sure the event is a seizure. Um, several different conditions can mimic seizures, and it's important for us to distinguish these mimickers from true seizures. Um, so as to not go down the wrong diagnostic path. For example, this is a dog that was referred to us for evaluation of, of seizures. You can see that we have these rhythmic contractions of the head, uh, and this dog actually would even salivate and the, the, the saliva would, would flip around, um, but this dog has idiopathic head tremors. This is a pet that we saw um, for a tetanus, um, it wasn't necessarily referred to us being confused for a seizure, but uh, you can see how it could be confused for a seizure, especially to a pet parent. You know, they might call and say, hey, my dog's having a seizure. She's lying on her side. You know, she's stiff. She's panting. She's salivating. She's not responding to me. That certainly sounds like the description of a seizure, um, but this obviously is not a seizure. Similarly, uh, this dog has myotonus. You can see these rhythmic contractions of the groups of muscles on the head. Um, this dog later developed myoclonus of the, the limbs uh, in the pelvic limbs and then the thoracic limbs. This dog uh, had distemper. And then one more example of uh, something that can be confused for a seizure, this dog actually has narcolepsy, but you can see where a pet parent might say, call you and say, you know, hey, my dog is passing out. Um, and she's not responding and can't get up, et cetera. So there are a handful of other conditions that might mimic seizures, things like syncope. Um, occasionally we can have a dog with severe vestibular disease that gets confused for seizures. Um, rarely or occasionally we can see a dog that's just severely painful that it's confused for a seizure and then a bunch of other things. So our next step after that Sorry. Our, our next step after our history and evaluation of signalment, et cetera, is an examination. So a complete physical examination can help us rule out things like, um, like syncope, but our neurological examination is important in formulating where exactly is the problem um, and what those possible causes are. So seizures tell us there's a problem in the cerebral cortex, however, recognizing other signs such as abnormal mentation, uh, head pressing as we see in the, the dog in the upper left, uh, compulsive walking in circles uh, like the dog in the upper right, postural reaction deficits, cranial nerve abnormalities such as an absent menace response or decreased nasal sensation, especially when it is asymmetric. And then focal seizures are all things that uh, make us think more about things affecting the brain as opposed to uh, things like idiopathic epilepsy. But beware the post-ictal exam. So dogs can act very abnormal immediately after a seizure. So um, while we should be doing our neurological examination, if it's immediately after a seizure, we should be prepared to repeat that examination later just because many dogs right after a seizure will act abnormal. So the causes of seizures, I like to break causes of seizures down into three main categories. Um, in general, I think of things outside of the brain. You, you may have been taught that as extracranial or you may have been taught that as metabolic, but what we mean is a, a problem outside of the brain that isn't physically wrong inside of the brain that secondarily affects the brain to cause the seizures. Things like hypoglycemia, portosystemic shunt, electrolyte abnormalities, uh, severe liver disease, severe kidney disease, occasionally severe anemia, polycythemia, et cetera, can all cause seizures. So these are things that aren't physically wrong with the brain, but affect the brain to cause a seizure. 
And most of these things we can rule out with blood tests, CBC, chemistry, urinalysis, uh, et cetera, bile acids, et cetera. <clears throat> the second broad category of causes of seizures is something physically wrong inside of the brain. Um, you may have been taught as intracranial or structural, but we, all, we mean things physically wrong inside of the brain. Things like brain tumors, things like encephalitis, meningitis, strokes, things like malformations like hydrocephalus, uh, brain infections, etc. And these are things that are best diagnosed with an MRI and possibly a spinal tap. The third main cause of seizures is idiopathic epilepsy. Idiopathic epilepsy is the most common cause of seizures in dogs. It's less common in cats. And while we can suspect it, um, there are a few generalizations that we make about dogs with idiopathic epilepsy. In general, their first seizure usually comes on between one and five years of age. Seizures are typically generalized clonic-tonic seizures, so that whole body, fall on the side, stiff, paddle, et cetera. Um, the pets are usually normal between seizures, and they usually have a normal neurological examination. So again, we might be able to uh, suspect that based off of regular seizures and uh, seizures starting between you know one and five years of age, but the only way we can truly diagnose idiopathic epilepsy is by ruling out all of the things outside of the brain and ruling out all of the things inside of the brain. So it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So one of the things, if any of you you know me, um, one of my my soap boxes is. Uh, there is a big difference between CT and MRI, and I'll, I'll still get phone calls saying, hey, I'm gonna send this pet over, I think it needs a, a CAT scan. So what I'm trying to illustrate here, that the panel on the left is a CAT scan, and um, my surgeon friend actually performed this CAT scan to look at this mass uh, that was affecting the frontal bone. So um, this guy right here. So they weren't performing it to look at the brain, but I use it as an example to show you how little you can see of the brain here. It's just kind of this, uh, this gray area, but you don't see much detail. It kind of looks the same as the tongue here. It kind of looks the same as the, the muscles of the head. Whereas the MRI on the right, we just get much greater soft tissue detail. So we can see the blood vessels within the brain. We can see uh, the gyri and sulci. We can see various anatomic structures with just really minute detail. So it's just so much more sensitive. There are lots of things that CAT scans will miss that MRIs show, things like strokes, things like encephalitis, things like uh, subtle abnormalities, smaller tumors, et cetera. So a CT should not be used for evaluating uh, pets with seizures. So we've looked at differential di uh, differentials based off of broad categories, but from a clinical standpoint, I like to sort out, well, gosh, what's most likely, what's least likely, um, and sort my differential list that way. The signalment and history play a vital role in formulating and sorting your differentials, um, but the neuro exam is also going to help further refine your differential list. For example, differential diagnoses for patients with a normal neurological examination include things like idiopathic epilepsy. Uh, extracranial causes can oftentimes have a normal uh, neurological examination, but even problems inside of the brain might have a, a normal neurological examination. So just because the exam is normal, we can't rule out a physical problem inside of the brain, but we make things like idiopathic epilepsy and metabolic a little bit higher on the list, um, or we keep it on the list based off of our normal neurological examination. Differential diagnoses for pets with an abnormal neurological examination, there are a handful of differentials that we keep in mind. Things like malformations, inflammation, infection, injury, such as trauma or stroke, neoplasia, and degenerative conditions of the brain. So, what I'm going to show here is a series of MRIs. Um, MRIs are very good for looking at the soft tissue of the brain, and what we're looking at is going to be a cross section, so a, a slice of bread kind of right like this, and we're going to be able to look on the inside of the brain. So again, things like malformations. Uh, this is an MRI that 
kind of shows fluid as being this uh, darker sort of grainy um, consistency. And the normal side of the brain is this left side over here. And there's this malformation of this fluid pocket that extends from the normal part, the, the ventricles, out to the surface of the brain. So this is a malformation. Again, this is another dog. It's a MRI slice right here. So we're looking at the right side on the right, left, dorsal, ventral. And this is a post-contrast T1 weighted image. And what we can see here is contrast enhancement of the coverings of the brain. Um, so this dog had cryptococcal meningitis or infection. This is a dog with inflammation of the brain. So this is kind of a classic MRI of a dog with inflammatory brain disease. So we see all of these bright spots or hyper intensities following the white matter on both sides of the brain. We're actually kind of in the occipital lobes here. So inflammation, uh, injury. So this dog had a, a stroke. This dark area in the lower left is a hemorrhagic stroke. This is a cat with a meningioma. So we see this contrast enhancing broad based mass that is pressing down and towards the left from the surface of the brain. So neoplasia and degeneration. So this is a MRI of a dog with cognitive dysfunction syndrome. We can just see how the brain appears atrophied or shrunken. The, the sulci are deep and wide. Uh, the interthalamic adhesion and just the makeup of the brain, the parenchyma, is atrophied compared to a normal brain. So certainly an MRI is the best way to image the brain and is indicated for most patients with seizures. But there are certain times where we don't necessarily need it, but then there are also certain times where it's very, very strongly indicated. So what are those times where we should be recommending just a little bit stronger to those pet parents that, hey, it's time to go pursue further diagnostics such as an MRI? And really those are times where idiopathic uh, epilepsy is less likely, where the signalment history or examination makes idiopathic epilepsy less likely. What are those times? Again, in a patient that's younger than one or older than five or six, um, a patient that is abnormal between episodes. So uh, the we have a seizure, say, on a Sunday, and on Thursday, dogs still acting blind, bumping into walls, um, seeming confused, etc. If there's an abnormal neurological examination, so postural reaction deficits, changes in mentation, walking in circles, uh, cranial nerve abnormalities, et cetera, those are all reasons that we should be suggesting further tests to that pet owner. Uh, certain breeds, even if they fall into that you know, one to five year category and they have a normal exam, if I've got, for example, a Maltese or a Chihuahua or a French Bulldog, um, just certain breeds that are more likely to get structural problems. Um, those three that I named are all more likely to get things like meningitis um, or encephalitis. Those are dogs that we would be recommending tests, even if they fell into that one to five category. Obviously, uh, Boston Terriers, Boxers, Older Golden Retrievers, et cetera, are all dogs that we should be recommending tests for. Cats, just because idiopathic epilepsy is less likely in cats, um, most cats should be getting an MRI, assuming all of their, their laboratory work is, is normal. And really, any patient with seizures that we haven't been able to identify a cause um, on, on blood tests should have an MRI performed. The way I explain it to pet parents is, if it were you or I that was having seizures and our blood work was normal and we didn't find an underlying cause in that manner, we would be getting an MRI. So it's the same approach for for dogs and cats with seizures. So now we're gonna transition over into talking about treatment of seizures. Um, I hope none of you are coming here expecting me to say, well, gosh, if you give this medication and then that medication, it's going to treat or it's going to fix 100% of seizures and 100% of your patients. Um, I'm just not gonna be able to do that for you. So there's no one best way to treat. There's no one best drug. And so instead of trying to teach you that, I'm going to, uh, sort of focus more on treatment principles. 
So treatment principle number one is, is when. When should we start treatment? When should we change treatment? When should we add more drugs? Uh, when should we be testing levels, et cetera? <clears throat> so when do we start treatment? Uh, treatment's indicated for patients with any episode of unprovoked status epilepticus. So what do we mean by that? Uh, dogs and cats that have status epilepticus, and it's not that we know that they got into a toad or, or something that would cause the seizure. Um, patients with multiple seizures in a short period of time, patients in which the frequency or severity are increasing over time, and patients where an underlying or progressive disorder, such as inflammatory brain disease or a brain tumor, et cetera, are either strongly suspected or have been diagnosed. So those are all pets that I would start anti-seizure medications for. In general, treating early. Too often I see um, where dogs have been having seizures and we don't start medications and the seizures are getting more frequent and more severe and um, we're trying to not start medications because we're worried about side effects, et cetera. It just in general, animals that we start treatment earlier, we tend to get control of the seizures or better control of the seizures over the long term um, much faster. So when should we test levels? In general, I test levels um, whenever steady state kinetics have been reached after starting or changing a dose or after a loading dose. Um, I check levels when seizures aren't controlled or we're not getting acceptable levels of control despite um, what is an uh, an adequate dose or what we expect to be an adequate dose, um, when signs of toxicity are noted, when, um, when signs of toxicity are noted, or every six to nine months, even in pets that are doing really, really well, just to make sure that we're not trending out or trending, uh, trending up or trending down. What drug, what dose, uh, et cetera. So principle number one, um, there's no best drug, uh, but you should become familiar with a variety of standard um, anti-epileptic drugs. My first and first line anti-epileptic drugs are phenobarbital and Keppra. So I'm comfortable with their doses, I'm comfortable with their side effects, I'm comfortable with their monitoring, and I feel they're efficacious for the vast majority of my patients. Um, you should start at a solid dose. Too often I see dogs and cats that are started on a low dose for the clinician's fear that they're going to have side effects, whether it's you know phenobarbital and liver problems or polyuria and polydipsia or sedation. Um, but by undertreating, you're more likely to not get the desired effects and the clients are much more likely to feel that, well, that drug that we tried never worked, so let's try something else. Um, and it might be really difficult for us to ever get them to go back and try that medication again. The next thing is maximizing one drug before uh, ditching it and going to a second, or even just adding a second. Very often I'll see dogs that are started on a, a low dose, and we really don't ever get into an adequate dose or um, even sort of a, a higher dose before starting a, a second medication. And I totally get that concept of wanting to minimize side effects, um, but it just becomes much harder for that pet parent that has to juggle two or three drugs, and again, they feel that maybe treatment isn't working. So, um, and then the next thing to do is to use serum levels to get an objective measurement. So, sure, if you aren't getting um, a lot of response on, say, phenobarbital, and we've increased the dose and we've maximized the dose, and then we've checked levels and it's in the therapeutic range, that's when I start considering adding in a second medication. Next treatment principle is uh, client education. So taking an extra 20, 30 minutes educating the client is gonna save you tons of phone calls down the road. Um, it will lead to a better outcome for your patient and it will keep your clients from uh, going to Google and uh, doing all of their searches there. We should be spending time talking with the, the client about um, the pros and cons of the medications. What do we expect the medication to do? What, are the, what do we don't expect the medication to do? What are the potential adverse effects? How long will those last? How serious are they? What sort of monitoring do we need to do to make sure that those 
um, adverse effects or the more serious ones aren't happening. Clients often need to just hear the words that we're starting this medication because yes, there are pros and cons of any medication, but we feel that the likelihood of this medication helping your pet far outweighs the likelihood of it hurting your pet or the, the side effects that um, it may cause. Clients need to be talked to about the importance of regular administration of medications. Um, so it's not something that we're going to give medications and you know sort of give them haphazardly. We need to talk with them about giving them on a regular basis. Um, many clients will benefit from keeping a seizure log. So that way we'll, we're able to tell, well, gosh, we were on this dose and then we changed it to that dose. And after that, our seizure frequency went from, say, every three weeks to every six weeks. So having them keep that log of when the seizure happened, what medications were we on, um, what changes, et cetera, and bringing that to the appointment help us make objective decisions. Clients need to be informed of the goals of therapy. Uh, many pet owners still are surprised when I tell them, well, gosh, I'm not just going to give you a pill or give you a course of medication for two weeks and the seizures are going to go away. They need to know that this is a long-term goal that we're aiming to, over time, decrease the frequency, uh, severity, and duration of seizures. So um, that is our goal, is to decrease the frequency, the severity, duration of seizures to a level that does not compromise the quality of life of the pet and the family while avoiding serious side effects. But I seldom expect to stop all seizures. Um, our goal is to decrease how often they happen, how severe each one, excuse me, is how long each one lasts. So, like I said before, first line anticonvulsants. Um, my two medications are, are phenobarbital and Keppra for the vast majority of my patients. Not all, but for the vast majority. Just a few years ago, phenobarbital and bromide were my first two, um, my two first-line drugs. Phenobarbital, uh, again, one of my first-line drugs um, and in dogs and my first-line anticonvulsant in cats. The initial dose is two and a half to four mg per kg twice a day um, orally and two and a half mg per kg BID in cats. Um, the dose should be tailored to the individual patients. It takes a couple of weeks to reach steady state and if levels are needed faster, so you've got a pet that comes in in status epilepticus um, and we need to get that drug into them faster, we can do a loading dose. The loading dose of phenobarbital is 16 mg per kg, but I never um have to give all 16 mg per kg at, at once. Um, that's just a recipe to really, really zonk them. I usually divide it into four mg per kg doses and spread that out over 24 hours. Sometimes I can do it, um, sometimes I need to do it faster. Sometimes just after one or two four mg per kg doses, we're able to get onto a maintenance dose of two and a half mg per kg. So side effects. Um, Pretty much every dog receiving phenobarbital, their, their ALKFOS is going to be elevated. And that by itself does not bother me. Um, if we are worried about liver damage and we're seeing things like the GGT being elevated, the bilirubin being elevated, um, a bile acids test and an abdominal ultrasound is just much more useful than just a, a chemistry panel. Um, occasionally, or I guess I should say rarely, we can have blood dyscrasias. Um, I've seen three pets that got pancytopenia on phenobarbital um, by stopping the medication and switching to a different drug. Um, we were able to have all three of those dogs do just fine. I test levels about three weeks after starting the medication um, or changing the dose. The therapeutic range according to the lab is 15 to 45. My range is much more narrowed. I kind of like pets being in the 25 to 30 range. Um, again, depending on how they're doing. If I am below 20, 25, I feel that pets, I'm not getting good enough control for them. Um, but when we start getting into the 32, 34, 35 range, I get much more worried about it actually being toxic. So my range is much more narrowed, 25 to 30. That said, we're not treating the number, we're treating the patient. We've got a dog that has a phenobarbital level of 12, but hasn't had a seizure for a year, I'm not going to increase it just because the, the level is low. 
Again, I use it frequently as a first-line drug, but I avoid it in animals with liver disease, portosystemic shunt, um, and I reach for it just a little bit slower than our next drug in large dogs, just because uh, just because they're big, the polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia end up being a bigger problem than in our, our small dogs. So Keppra, or Levetiracetam, um, we use this very, very frequently now. Like I said previously, uh, it was kind of a second-line drug. To me now, it's a, a first-line drug for, for certain patients or for many of my patients. Um, the dose, the starting dose is 20 to 30 mg per kg three times a day. And it's a very safe drug with a um, high margin of safety. So I'll often just increase, if I'm not getting the effects that I'm looking for, not enough effects, increase in 20 mg per kg increments. I'll usually stop at around 60 to 70 mg per kg, but I do know neurologists that have gone as high as 100 mg per kg. Um, it's not metabolized by the liver, so we can use it oftentimes in conjunction or um, instead of phenobarbital for patients with hepatic disease. Side effects are minimal. We don't expect things like polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, um, but sometimes we see some mild sedation. It does not last for a long time. Um, you know, I usually set pet parents up for you know a week or two of, of sedation. Many times it's much less than that. It's my preferred add-on for cats. Um, so I'll usually start cats on phenobarbital, and if I need to add something on, I'll usually go to Keppra. One of the main downsides of Keppra um, used to be that we could only give it three times a day. Um, now there is an extended release formulation that comes in 500 milligrams or greater, so we can use it for our larger pets, um, but we still can't use it routinely for our smaller pets. Um, just you cannot break the tablets into, um, you cannot break the tablets. So uh, there's also what's called a honeymoon effect with Keppra in that many animals will respond really, really well when we start it and they go, they're seizure free or their seizures are uh, severely decreased for the first, um, you know, four or five months. But then after that, it returns back to, uh, to baseline levels. I use it as a first-line drug. I'll, I'll certainly use it before things like phenobarbital with their, when they're weird seizures, so things like fly-biting seizures, focal seizures, seizures that are brought on by sound or light, um, seizures where the pet isn't necessarily losing consciousness, et cetera. Um, if, that, if it's a small dog and the pet owner um, just says, hey, there's no way I'm gonna be able to give something three times a day, obviously we have that conversation, but that's one of the downsides and we might lean to a different anti-seizure medication than Keppra if three times a day dosing is not possible for that client. Potassium bromide, certainly we use a lot less of it now, but I do still think that there's a place for it. Um, the maintenance dose is 30 to 40 mg per kg uh, once a day. For animals that I'm using it as a uh, sole drug, I'm usually giving 35 to 40. If I'm using it as an add-on, I'm more in the 30 to 35 mg per kg range. Um, similarly, when we test levels, um, I'm shooting for sort of a one to two range if I am using it as a add-on or a two to three range. So the, um, the therapeutic range is, is one to three. So I'm shooting for one to two if I'm using it as an add-on or two to three if I'm using it as a, a sole agent. Sometimes we need to get bromide in a little bit faster so you can use a loading dose. The loading dose is 400 to 600 mg per kg. Um, but similar to phenobarbital, I usually never give that all at once. Um, especially in bromide, I'll often load it over four or five days and divide that dose into a BID dose given over four to five days. So um, bromide's renally excreted, so it's nice, we can work it, we can use it um, in conjunction with phenobarbital uh, and our other medications. It's it's nice one for dogs with portosystemic shunts, uh, et cetera. Side effects, uh, similar to phenobarbital, polyuria, polydipsia, sedation, it can cause a stiff, stilted pelvic limb gait, um, and occasionally has been associated with pancreatitis. Um, not necessarily it, that it causes pancreatitis, but simply because we have other drugs that we can use. If I have a dog that has a history of pancreatitis or um, a dog that's on bromide and then the uh, 
dog develops pancreatitis, just because we have other options, I'll try and wean off of the bromide and switch to something else. I use it as a second or third line drug. Um, I use it in pets that have hepatic disease. Um, and the, the nice things are it's a once a day drug and it comes in a liquid. So for our small pets, we can really titrate the dose um, for them as opposed to having to split the pills. Can't give it to cats. Uh, it causes a, a pneumonitis and I avoid it in animals with pancreatitis. Sinisamide is a, a newer anticonvulsant. Um, I sort of use it as a second or third line drug. The dose by itself is a is five mg per kg BID, but if we are on phenobarbital, we should be giving a, a higher dose, uh, somewhere in the eight to ten mg per kg uh, BID, eight, eight to ten mg per kg um, orally BID. It is metabolized by the liver, um, so sometimes if I have a dog that's on phenobarbital and we're concerned about liver function and we're making the argument to turn to take them off of phenobarbital or decrease it. Zinismide is not one of the ones that I'm usually reaching for in that case. Um, side effects, uh, dry eye, IMHA, those are kind of uh, a little different than all of the other ones. It's relatively uncommon, but just like any other drug when we're starting it, we're talking with the, the, the client about what are the potential side effects, um, what are the risks, what are the pros and cons, et cetera, and what are we going to be monitoring for? So. Again, I use it as a second or third line, as an add-on drug. Um, I avoid it in animals with hepatic disease. Um, I avoid it in animals with previous IMHA or dry eye. And as part of my monitoring, these dogs, in addition to things like chemistry panels, we're doing CBCs um, and we're doing Schirmer tear tests. CBD oil, um, I used to get kind of a, a question on this once or twice a year. Now I get a question on it once or twice a day. Um, and the, the long story short is at this point, we don't have enough information to be routinely recommending it to say that there is a positive effect, that it is safe, and to know how it interacts with other drugs. Um, currently, uh, the AVMA and DEA stance on CBD is that we um, can't be or shouldn't be prescribing it. It's still a Schedule One controlled uh, substance, and we don't have enough studies to say what does it do and um, what are the positives and negatives of it. There are a handful of um, publications. This is uh, one that I found a, a little while ago um, that they basically looked at three dogs and um, the dogs ranged in um, age and breed, uh, ranged from three to 11 years old. There weren't any diagnostics. There was a large dose range of a half mg per kg to five mg per kg per day. Uh, dog number one was a lab with seizure-like episodes starting at six months of age, um, where the dog lay shivering on the floor with the head up lasting several minutes. So again, we've got a, a couple concerns here. Seizures started at six months of age. So, you know, is this dog truly an epileptic? Um, and are these even seizures? Because they're not classic, certainly. The dog lay shivering with his head up um, and it lasted several minutes. Dog two, 11-year-old um, Papillon, seizures since three years of age, is receiving standard anti-epileptic drugs. Dog three was a nine-year-old Chihuahua, again with seizures for, for several years, um, but no treatment. So, you know, that raises the question, well, was this a, a pet owner that was sort of biased against things like medications and biased towards uh, a more, uh, I guess, away from drugs? Dog one had six episodes this year. They were happening every 30 days. Dog two had episodes every two to three months, and dog three had two episodes this year. Um, the, the, the report was in August, so presumably two episodes in eight months at irregular intervals. And the study design was basically looking at the seizure interval for the two months um, while receiving a CBD product and comparing it to the pretreatment frequency and then asking the owners, well, gosh, do you think we had an improvement or not? Dog one's owner felt the signs improved. Dog two felt there was no improvement. That was the one that was already on zonisamide. And dogs three, dog three's owner felt there was considerable improvement. So the, the conclusion at the end of that was that seizure frequency improved considerably and owners reported a positive impression. 
And I, I guess I wouldn't have come to that exact same um, conclusion. You know, I, I would have said, hey, this is what happened in these three dogs. Um, but my issues with it are we only had three dogs. So, you know, it's a low sample size, short treatment period. It was only two months, but um, two of the three dogs had pretreatment intervals greater than two months um, even before being on the medication. So it wasn't a blinded study. It wasn't standardized. There wasn't really any testing to be sure that these dogs actually had idiopathic epilepsy or had seizures at all and there was no placebo control. So um, not necessarily dinging the study, but just looking at it through a somewhat critical eye because that's what people are coming to me and coming to you for of, well, hey, you're the expert on this. You've gone to lots of school. What is your recommendation? So Colorado State uh, published a study last year um, where they did look at CBD oil in dogs with seizures, and it was certainly a, a um, a step in the right direction with regards to answering, um, you know, the, the questions at hand. They started off with 26 dogs with intract intractable idiopathic epilepsy. Um, they started off with 12 in the CBD group and 14 in a placebo group. Um, after the, the study, um, I believe it was nine in the CBD group were able to complete the study and seven in the placebo group um, finished the study. They basically looked at um, seizure frequency uh, with the CBD, CBD group compared to the placebo group. Um, so the conclusion at that was there was a significant reduction in seizure frequency for dogs that received CBD, but the proportion of responders between those two groups was similar. So um, still don't have the answer, but that was certainly a, a study and a step in the right direction. But what they finished that study with was, well, we still don't know, is it safe, is it effective, and what other interactions does it have with medications, um, with other medications. So the, the next study that they're doing is sort of expanding on that. Um, basically, in order to be part of that study, the dog needs to have two or more seizures per month for four consecutive months while receiving standard anti-epileptic drugs at therapeutic levels. Um, the pets are all going to be examined by a neurologist. They're all going to have an MRI and a spinal tap. And what we're trying to do there is basically um, have as uniform of a population as possible. And then it's going to be a, a crossover study. So basically two groups, group number one for the first three months gets CBD, group number two gets placebo um, for those three months. And then there's a one month washout period and then they switch. So group number one will get placebo and group number two will get the CBD product. Um, so hopefully that will give us a lot more information on that. So um, when I when I give this lecture or when I speak to, to clients, um, and, you know, I, I'm always concerned that I'm coming off as just, you know, this, this anti-CBD guy. Um, but the reality is I don't know the answers. And in order for me to make a recommendation that's best for that patient, you know, I need to know, again, is it safe? Is it effective? Um, Etc. So I do feel someday I'll be using CBD for certain dogs with seizures in conjunction with other anti-epileptic drugs, but again, I don't know that until we get more information. And then the, the last thing we're going to look at here is uh, emergency treatment of, of dogs with seizures. So um, you're presented with this patient, um, it comes in having an active seizure. Uh, what do you do? And lots of doctors will do different things, but just wanted to share with you our status epilepticus protocol. Um, if you can't read that on your screen in the downloads, um, we have this as a, as a download for you. And we um, use this sort of almost like a CPR chart where it kind of has this flow, uh, you know, do this first, do that next, et cetera. So, um, step one, it, it used to be intravenous, intra, wow, intravenous diazepam. Um, now we're more likely to give midazolam just based off of what's available. Um, uh, midazolam can be given intranasal as opposed to um, rectal valium, and there is a study that shows intranasal midazolam um, worked faster and, and better than, than rectal valium. But um, first dose of, of medications to get that seizure stopped, once we get that seizure stopped, 
we should be placing an IV catheter, getting some quick assessment tests, um, and drawing blood for um, things like a CBC chemistry panel, et cetera, to rule out things outside of the brain. The diazepam and dazolam can be repeated up to three times, but remember, these are short-acting drugs. They're really good for stopping that seizure, but they're not good at preventing the next seizure from coming. So um, most of these patients, if they come to you looking like that dog that we just showed you, they're going to need a longer-acting epileptic drug. Um, we often go to phenobarbital or Keppra as our first-line um, emergency drug um, or or longer acting emergency drugs. So phenobarbital, if the pet's already on phenobarb, um, when we draw that blood for a CBC and chemistry panel, we also need to draw blood into a plain top tube to be getting a phenobarbital level if we haven't done that recently. If um, the pet is not on phenobarbital before loading, excuse me, um, is not on phenobarbital, we don't need to worry about getting that sample um, before loading. Again, the loading dose is 16 mg per kg, but I usually give four mg per kg in four doses spread out over 24 hours or quicker if that pet needs that. Remember, there is about a 15 to 20 minute delay um, for full effect of, of phenobarbital. So don't expect right after that four mg per kg um, that we're going to get our, our full effect. Seizures stop. We move on to maintenance therapy of two and a half to three mg per kg orally of phenobarbital, um, checking levels in three weeks. Um, if seizures continue, the next step would be something like intravenous Keppra. Um, we'll usually give a first dose of 30 to 60 mg per kg um, and then uh, continue in 20 to 30 mg per kg, either IV or if we. Um, if the pet is able, switching to oral medications. Kind of the third line from there would be something like bromide. Um, you can give that rectally. Also, the potential other third line would be going to a midazolam CRI. Um, so that's kind of what happens here. We start with either phenobar, excuse me, we start with midazolam. Um, we get a longer acting, whether it's phenobarbital or Keppra. Um, after that, if that has not controlled it, we go to Keppra or phenobarbital, depending on which one we started. And then from there, some of our neurologists um, will go to bromide. Um, some of them will go to a midazolam CRI. There are a handful of other CRIs um, on the bottom there, uh, Valium CRIs. Propofol CRI um, will actually uh, stop the seizure activity outwardly, but does not necessarily stop the abnormal electrical activity. Um, same thing with isoflurane. So again, um, those are in the download section if, uh, if you'd like it. That is what I have for you today. Uh, thank you very much. Have we been getting questions? Okay, I'm gonna come out of this. Cannot hear. <laughs> um, afternoon. Hi. Thanks for the webinar. Do you want to? Did you kind of um, collate them into? Uh, hi. Thanks for the webinar. My question is: What is your opinion using EEG? Do you use it? In which cases? Sure. So the the question is: um, What's my opinion on EEG or electroencephalography? Um, basically, that is a method to um, record the electrical activity of the um, the neurons on the very surface of the brain. Um, personally, I don't have a lot of experience with EEG. Um, there are some hospitals that have it and use it, and for, I guess, the, the utility of EEG would be, for me, um, pets where I'm not sure that it's a seizure, so it's not a classic generalized clonic tonic seizure and the dogs you know having twitches or, or whatnot and we're trying to answer the question is it actually a seizure or not um that would be one place the other would be sometimes animals can um have seizures that don't outwardly look like paddling or can start off with paddling um and they're having status epilepticus 
but we get the paddling under control, but there's still this abnormal electrical activity or these, um, we're still having seizures within the brain, but we're not seeing something on the, the outside. That to me would be the other place of using EEG to say, do we have that seizure under control? So the short answer is we don't use a lot of EEG um, from a getting to a diagnosis of what's the underlying cause. You know, sure, before MRI existed, that was a way that uh, doctors would um, use it to try and come up with a, a diagnosis, um, but MRI is just a zillion times better. Um, again, the times for me to use it would be, is it a seizure or not? And have I gotten that seizure under control in a patient that I'm concerned about non-convulsive status epilepticus? All right, so next question is, why is there a range from one to five years of idiopathic epilepsy? What is it about those ages and brain development? Ah, uh, fair question. So the question is, you know, why is it between one and five years of age and what is it about um, brain development? Um, I mean, animals can develop epilepsy or seizures without a physical structural cause um, or a metabolic cause outside of those years. I mean, I'll diagnose seven-year-old dogs, eight-year-old dogs, 12-year-old dogs even sometimes with new onset seizures that have normal blood work and normal MRI, normal spinal tap, et cetera. Um, so it's not that it only comes on between one and five years of age. It's that younger than that, we're more likely to have other causes and older than that, we're more likely to have other causes. So I guess it's not a, um, a hard and fast rule, but it's more guidelines. Um, Great question of what is it with regards to the brain development, because um, that certainly is when we see it most. Um, I don't have that answer for you of, of, I guess, what it is with the brain development. All right, so how long after a seizure can a patient with idiopathic epilepsy have an abnormal neurologic exam? So the, the question is, how long after a seizure can a pet with idiopathic epilepsy have an abnormal neurological exam. Um, so that post-ictal phase, I mean, for most animals, it's you know less than an hour or so. So you know, right after it, they're howling or you know panting. Um, so most dogs within an hour. I mean, um, you read things like you know up to 24 hours. I've certainly never seen a dog with diagnosed idiopathic epilepsy be abnormal um, 24 hours after a seizure. But the things we need to take into account are, you know, well, what, let's say that dog has had a, a ton of seizures and is in the hospital. You know, we've given a bunch of medications that are going to make that dog sleepy. Um, there are changes that we see within the brain, um, and I don't use the word brain damage, but um, effects on the brain that um, may cause that dog to, to still be sleepy, you know, or or inappropriate greater than 24 hours later, but it's oftentimes hard for me to say, well, how much of it is drugs and how much of it is just because we've had a ton of seizures. But the vast majority of dogs, you know, hour two, certainly 24. So we have a couple of questions that fall in the same category. The first is if you could touch on dosing with extended release Keppra, and then do you use long acting Keppra for owners who can't give TID? Or do you suggest a different type of care? So the, the question is around extended release Keppra. Um, so I the dose of extended release Keppra, it's it's the same. So you're still using you know 30 mg per kg, um, increasing in 20 mg per kg increments, but we're just giving it twice a day instead of three times a day. Um, some dogs actually even do best on three times a day extended release. So um, occasionally we'll either start a dog on extended release or we'll start them on regular TID and then for one reason or another we switch to BID extended release. Um, and some of those dogs still need to go on three times a day extended release. What was the, the first part of the question? So dose and be recommended for people who can yeah, so so um, so we we use extended release Keppra frequently. So the question was, you know, um, if they couldn't give um, three times a day, 
would I go to bromide as opposed to extended release? Um, no, I mean, if I was thinking Kepra to begin with, the vast majority of our dogs go on extended release as opposed to we switch them to something else. Most of the time, just because extended release comes in, you know, 500s, we're using them in 500s, 750s, 1,000, um, they're usually bigger patients, which means if I were to go to something like bromide, it would be a whopping dose. If I was to go to something like um, phenobarbital, it would be a large dose. So um, we use extended release Kepra very, very frequently, and um, I guess I would go to extended release for most of my patients before switching it to something else if it was that the client can't give it three times a day anymore. All right, so we have a question on a treatment for limbic epilepsy. Yeah, I, I guess um, we're talking presumably cats and, and I mean, if you've diagnosed that, um, question so I guess what's how do I how do I actually see the full question I can only do I have to just click on it oh there we go uh do we dispense rescue meds for owners um yeah so kind of uh you know in the event of a so They'll, they'll go home, so let's say it's an idiopathic epileptic um, patient, and we know that they um, are likely to have clusters. So it's a dog that every time it has one seizure, it's going to have four. Um, or every time it has one seizure, it's a five-minute seizure. It's a, it's a long seizure. So we're trying to avoid status epilepticus. We're trying to avoid that patient having to go to the emergency room. Um, we're trying to give those owners something um, something that they can do at home to avoid things getting worse for their pet. So it's not for every single dog. Some dogs are going to have a 30-second seizure, be done with it, et cetera. So those don't necessarily go home with, with rescue drugs, but we're using it in dogs that we're concerned about them getting into an emergency situation where they have to go to an emergency hospital. Um, we will send home intranasal midazolam. Um, we'll usually give two, maybe three um, pre-drawn doses of it. Um, and for certain cases, we'll also um, send home um, or prescribe clorazepate. It's the um, three doses, TI, excuse me, nine doses, TID for three days, so nine doses. Um, so we'll send that home. My personal feel is I don't see a, a whole lot of um, bang for my buck for the for the clorazepate, um, but it's inexpensive, and if it helps that pet and keeps them, you know, out of the emergency hospital, um, you know, happy to do that. But we also warn or educate clients on when should they go to an emergency room. Um, seizures lasting longer than three minutes, multiple seizures in one day, or um, one seizure right after another where the pet does not return back to normal. Um, so next question I see here, my dog was recently diagnosed with seizures, but it only happens in the morning when waking up. Um, is this a common thing? So, um, so I, I guess similar to the rest of the approach, um, is it truly a seizure? So, you know, if this, if your dog is losing consciousness, falling on its side, paddling, pooping, peeing, you know, we're comfortable that it's a seizure. Um, that to me is step number one. Um, I guess there are a couple different reasons that we might have a seizure early in the morning. Dogs with idiopathic epilepsy, many times they do have their seizures when the mind is quiet, when, um, when they're resting. So many pet owners will come and say, you know, my dog has a seizure at three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, et cetera. So it's not super uncommon, um, I guess, depending on the character of your pet seizures and what other tests have been done, you know, sure, could we make the argument of maybe something like hypoglycemia and, you know, since your pet has been fasting since dinner at six o'clock the day before, would that be a reason for seizures, you know, six o'clock the following morning? But uh, so I guess there are some 
some aspects that I, I don't have here to fully answer, but some dogs will have idiopathic epilepsy. Some dogs with idiopathic epilepsy will have their seizures oftentimes late at night, early in the morning when they're resting, et cetera. Um, so uh, thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. Um, my question is about gabapentin and pregabalin. Um, what's my opinion? Um, from a seizure st seizure management standpoint, um, gabapentin usually doesn't make it into my repertoire. Occasionally, we'll see a dog that you know has say Chiari-like malformation and um, also has seizures. You know, we, we kind of say things like, "Well, it might be helping a little bit," but I usually won't have um, gabapentin be part of my my regular kind of drugs one, two, three, four, five. Um, pregabalin, I, I guess I can still say it's newer. Um, it just is much more uh, specific for um, for a binding site and um, for, for seizures. I actually, uh, just because of its expense, haven't used it that frequently. Um, I know a couple of the other neurologists here have prescribed it on occasion. So it's just something, um, I guess, until the cost comes down, um, I'm not using it frequently. Um, when do you decide to use mannitol for status epilepticus? Um, fair, fair question. Um, I think it comes down to you know your your comfort level. There, there usually is not a downside. Um, to giving mannitol or hypertonic saline. Um, if a dog's had a, a long seizure, we can make the argument with all of this um, electrical activity and uh, the physiological things that are happening in the brain. Is there um, swelling or edema um, in the brain? We can make that argument. So um, we'll often give hypertonic saline or mannitol for dogs with that are getting status epilepticus. Um, so I'm kind of of the thought process. If I if I think of giving mannitol, it's probably warranted. Um, so I give it frequently. Ah, uh, good question. Um, next question is, what is your recommendation for flea tick control with pets with seizure disorders? Um, and uh, we we get that a lot and um. So things like Comfortis, Trifexis, Nexgard, you know, ones that the the label says, you know, can cause seizures in um, dogs that we already have seizures, you know, we've got other options, so we try and avoid it. Excuse me. Um, with regards to things like um, HeartGuard and, uh, you know, Revolution and, and things like that, um, there, in theory, those can, um, I like to say, cause seizures, but dogs that are already prone to seizures um, can lower seizure threshold and make it more likely that they have that seizure. So, um, so I don't go taking every dog with seizures off of heart guard and switching them to something else. Um, but if we are seeing a definitive pattern, if um, the owner asks about it just because we have other options. Um, we're, we're often uh, recommending things like um, Interceptor and uh, Sentinel. Um, I know that probably drives a, a lot of you crazy in that, you know, at least for, for quite some time, it was hard to, to get a hold of those. But um, so really the, the only firm answer there is, uh, you know, avoiding the Comfortis, um, NexGuard, et cetera. If you have a patient that's been on two or three, excuse me, two or more anti-epileptic drugs and been seizure-free for over a year, is there a specific medication you wean before the other, i.e. pheno, kepra, zanisamide? Um, so the, the, the question, so you've got a dog, you've got, you know, it was, you have them on, say, three medications right now, um, and they've been seizure-free for, over, for over a year, is there one that you start taking away? Um, usually, if you have that dog on three medications, it means at one point in time things were getting pretty, pretty hectic, pretty crazy. That we made the argument of, well, gosh, one isn't zero, isn't cutting it, one isn't cutting it. We're on three medications. Um, so, let's say that dog's been seizure-free for for a year. Um, I usually have the conversation with the owner of, well, gosh, 
you know, things are going knock on wood, you know, really well right now. We haven't had a seizure in a year. You know, we, we can start talking about decreasing medications. The challenge becomes knowing, as your question is stated here, you know, what medication it, are, are we changing? Um, we can make the argument of, well, gosh, is it a combination of all three medications? Um, or is it one that's doing the heavy lifting? So sometimes we'll have a dog that, you know, had a ton of seizures on phenobarbital, as an example, a ton of seizures on zanisamide, and then you know, goes seizure-free for a year right after starting Kepra. We can make the argument, well, gosh, Kepra is doing the heavy lifting here. Um, in this example where I've given the dog phenobarbital and zanisamide, you know, we'd be watching the um, the liver values and the liver function very, very closely. Um, based on one, how dog is doing, two, side effects that we're seeing on the drugs, three, um, serum levels. Um, you know, are we on really comfortable levels of the phenobarbital where we're not worried that we're in toxic levels, et cetera? Um, those are all things that factor into that decision as well as owner decisions. Um, I'll often say things like, what's going to keep you up more at night giving three medications and, well, gosh, we really only needed two, or, um, you know, the likelihood of, well, gosh, did we take away, did we have that sweet spot with these three medications and we took one away? And um, so I, I, I like to involve the owner. Let's say the owner says, well, gosh, I really want to, you know, I just can't give three medications anymore. Um, uh, there are various factors, again, patient factors, cost factors, um, you know, which if this owner can't be giving something three times a day and we're on phenocheparins and isamide, you know, might we be getting rid of the Keppra? Uh, there just a lot of factors. You know, if we made the argument that Keppra is doing all of the hard work, it'd be tough to make that argument that um, we should be taking that one away simply because of it being TID. So there isn't really one answer there. Um, it's a lot of things. How's the dog doing? What doses are we on? What are our levels? Which medications seem to make the biggest difference, et cetera? Um, but fantastic question. Um, so I'm going to answer one last question here. Um, other questions I will answer via email. So if I didn't get to it, um, don't worry. I will. Uh, Am I going to send out one group email to everyone for their benefit? Or we will answer your questions. You will get an answer to your question um, if it is not this next one, promise. Um, um, so And now what do I do? I finish with that sound. Um, ooh, these are good questions. I'm trying to find one that's kind of most applicable to, to lots of people. Um, wow. Yeah, so um, I've got two questions right in a row here about intranasal midazolam. Um, yes, we, so um, for intranasal midazolam, what dose do you use and is it the five mg per, per ml? Um, so it, it's the exact same, it's the injectable formulation. We just give it intranasally there. There is a, an aerosolizer attachment that's like 99 cents or something really inexpensive that helps instead of just squirting the um, the liquid in, it sort of aerosolizes it to make it more um, readily absorbable through the, the nasal mucosa. Um, with regards to dose, we, we've got it up there um, in the, uh, the status epilepticus protocol, um, the 0.2 to 0.5 mg per kg IV or one mg per kg uh, intranasally. And the second question that was right after it that had to do with midazolam, um, can I use midazolam injectable as intranasal? Yes. Or is there a specific pharmacological presentation 
um, as intranasal. Um, so no, we're just using the injectable. All right, well, thank you for your attention. I, I think that uh, went just over an hour. Um, I hope you guys learned a lot. Um, I hope this was useful. I hope you're not all going crazy um, being being stuck at home or kids at home or or whatnot. And um, I'm going to go wash my hands now. <laughs>